Hi everyone, my name is Alessandra Gomez and I'm a curatorial assistant at The Shed. And I'm really thrilled to introduce this commission by artist Tomas Saraceno as part of Up Close. And a little bit about Tomas and his practice. For over a decade, he's been imagining more equitable modes of existence with the environment and also challenging the conventions of art, architecture, and science through interdisciplinary projects that take the form of floating sculptures, community projects, and interactive installations. And Tomas invited this phenomenal group of speakers as part of Up Close in response to his long-term and multi-year research on air quality, pollution, and thinking about environmental racism. And he's been bridging connections between different researchers, activists, and communities. So as part of Up Close for the first conversation, he's invited medical journalist Harriet A. Washington to speak about the long-term and disproportionate effects of pollution on communities of color in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And they know each other because Tomas has drawn direct inspiration from Harriet's book called A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind for his artwork called We Do Not All Breathe the Same Air, which is a visualization of air quality data that shows the uneven distribution of pollution across the US. And the artwork consists of these very long filter paper strips with tiny dots that range in color from light gray to black. And each dot is an hourly measurement of pollution in the air. So the darker the dot, the more pollution that's been measured. And these filter paper strips come from a machine called the BAM, which is used by a lot of environmental protection and regulation agencies to monitor pollution in the US. And this artwork will premiere as part of his forthcoming exhibition at the shed called Particular Matters. And it's actually an expanded version from one that he did in 2018 called Calendar Loon Air, which was shown in Paris. He collected filter paper strips from an organization called Air Parif, responsible for monitoring the air quality. As we've been collecting these filter paper strips from states across the US for the past year, from states like Alaska, Hawaii, California, and Massachusetts, so you'll start to notice that we do not all breathe the same air. And it's a title that Tomas felt was a bit more precise. And so as part of this second conversation, he's invited Bronx-based urban designer and researcher Oscar Oliver Didier to be in conversation with New York City activist Leslie Velasquez from El Puente and Michael Johnson from South Bronx Unite to talk about their own work in connection to some of the ideas that Tomas has been researching as well for the past couple of years. Hello, Harriet. I'm so pleased to be here today in conversation with you. I want to start by saying a big thank to you and to the team at The Shed, especially the chief curator Emma Enderby and Alessandra Gomez, who just gave us this fabulous introduction and did so much good work collecting air quality stripes from across the United States. And to my team at the Aerosin Foundation, with whom I have been studying air quality and imagining the right to breathe clean air for years. And to most of all, to you, Harriette, for your research, for joining me today, and for having an ongoing conversation with me on the unequal distribution of air pollution across racial lines, which have been so influential to my work. I'm also so proud and honored of the beautiful essay you wrote for the catalog of the exhibition at the Shed. It is so incredibly important, the work you and other activists have been doing for years, and I hope that our conversation will encourage more people to read your thinking and try for change in their own communities too. I remember one of the last time we talked, Harriette, it was around the end of the last year, to discuss the artwork, We Do Not Breathe All the Same Air, which is an artwork we started in Paris while doing the exhibition in Palais de Tokyo. With the organization Air de Paris, who provided us with this BAM stripes from Paris and who also look at environment justice and inequality. Because we were able to borrow this time, thanks to Alessandra and to the shed, his BAM machine to do our own quality stripe measurements around New York City. And for that, we were also really inspired by the work of El Puente, 
and the director of which, Leslie Velasquez, I had the pleasure to meet last October when I visited New York, who is also part of the Up Close Roundtable today, who have been doing independent air quality monitoring playground in the south city of Williamsburg. And what we wanted was to be able to show clearly how different the air we breathe is even just within one city. And how much has the world changed since then? We are now in the midst of a respiratory pandemic that has made us reconsider the connection that some of us have with the world, while also making shockingly clear the reality and effects of the environmental and medical racism and the death of the George Floyd and the astounding power of the Black Lives Matter protests bring again into the spotlight the necessity to end racial discrimination and police brutality. Your work is resounding more than ever. Our conversation seems to reflect the build-up of these events, even thought we did not knew that then. These disparities, these injustices reverberate with such a clarity now in 2020. The elevated numbers of death related to COVID in Black, Latinx, and Indigenous American community. Just to give a bit of context to our listener, the CDC just reported that Latinx and Black communities have three times higher rates of corona compared to the white population. Protesters choking on tear gas after George Floyd repeatedly said, I can't breathe. There is this repeated assault on breath, something that seems to be such a natural right. And I want to see what positive change we can work towards during this time when injustice are so exposed so plainly. So for my first question, I'd like to ask you to talk a bit about your research, what you have been thinking about and teaching and how the rest of us can connect to this reality that for a lot of people hasn't been present or clear, but which you have been making present for a long time. I think so your insight can touch upon the wider connection we have seen now between the elevated rates of people of color dying from COVID to so many of the reality tragic racist treatment of many Black Lives Matter protesters. Thomas, it is such a pleasure to talk to you. And that is a very perceptive question. I think the book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, in which I talk about environmental racism and introduce people to the concept and explain how devastating it is. Of course, air pollution is by far the worst contaminant that people face. The others are still pretty bad and, and quite devastating, but air pollution, because of its diffuse nature, is um, in a special danger. And it's really important to understand that the slow violence of environmental assaults doesn't happen in a vacuum. Unfortunately, we're never just talking about one assault. We're never just talking about a pollution worn by the air, the many, many types of pollution worn by the air, and we're never just talking about exposure to lead. There's a synergy here. The fact that these exposures very often tend to be greater than their um, additive effects, the exposure is greater than the individual effects, is something that we're just not even equipped to measure you know, much less understand well. But it's very important to understand that these airborne dangers are much more harmful, even though we can't see most of them. Uh, seeing the smog, of course, is very oppressive. People can see it, react to it. But so many of the dangers are not visible and are easy to ignore if you choose to ignore them. So mm -hmm. um, your work, I think, is, I felt particularly resonated with me because this particular exhibit is a way of, you know, showing people visibly making the invisible visible. And I think that the disparate exposure to people of color are very important. The harms of air pollution make people more susceptible to coronavirus infection. Um, one example I gave in an article in Nature is that air pollution exacerbates kidney disease. It causes kidney disease and kidney vulnerabilities. Not something that one would, um, you know, immediately think of. It's ter not exactly, intuitive, but it is something that has been proven by research. So the kidney disease and the kidney vulnerabilities that heighten one's susceptibility to coronavirus infection are largely caused by air pollution. People who have disparate exposure to air pollution 
Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans are going to have higher rates of coronavirus. And that actually plays for every single environmental exposure. Every single one from asthma to air pollution to heavy metals makes one more susceptible to coronavirus. So it's an unintended consequence, something that would, would have been really hard to foresee. And yet there it is. And we didn't see it sooner because we didn't do adequate data collection in this country, unfortunately. Yes, it is quite astounding. Also, this is such an important connection. This co-action of environmental pollutants, how an airborne virus like COVID become even more dangerous for someone who suffered lead-related kidney damage. I constantly refer back to this idea of the web of life. Yet, if a community is hit by many environmental pollutants, threats of the web being to break, become weakened. And as you said, it is not just black and Hispanic community, but indigenous population as well. Yeah, actually, you know, if you look at the rates, they're suffering more, but they don't have much visibility because their numbers are so low. In fact, one researcher who I will not name, when I pointed out that Native Americans had some of the highest rates of mm. disease due to environmental exposure, said, but it's only 2% of the population. Mm. But I responded, yes, because of genocide. You know, mm. you can't discount it on that factor. So yes, you're right. I mean, this exposure is, again, it's not only deadly and devastating, but it's, in my opinion, it's inadequately studied, which is one reason why I wrote the book. People are not adequately aware of it because I don't think scientists in general have done a good enough job of making people aware of it. In your book, Deadly Monopolies, you coined the term biocolonialist, which is the exploitation of people and living things to meet solely the needs of affluent people in the Western world. Talking specifically about drug patenting, how this corporation can claim ownership over native bodies and plants and resources and have the law still on their side. And it raised these huge questions, as you also did in Medical Apartheid, of from where and whose expenses we get scientific progress and knowledge, both whose live and whose own history of knowledge. And I think so. What we all feel at the moment is that science has to be somehow readdressed with a kind of new way of integrating knowledge and how this diversity of knowledge is produced and shared. You are at the same time in your book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, criticizing what intelligence means and how we can measure intelligence. In Argentina, at the beginning of January of this year, we were working with indigenous community who are suffering from the environmental and economical effects of lithium extraction. They live in the Salt Lake in Jujuy, the northern region of Argentina, part of the lithium triangle that produces more than half of the world's lithium. And everybody wants lithium right now. This means also when you talk about a Native American population in North America being silenced, even by some academic, we've seen a parallel problem in South America, where the voices of indigenous community are somehow not heard, or just simply ignored. Ecological thinking is based on building sustainable transition. By and then why we're still extracting finite resources with absolutely no consideration for the population who lives in this area. We want to challenge this mindset, encourage new ways of thinking and acting. So we did this project in Salinas Grandes in Argentina, where for the first time in human history, a person flow without the need of solar panels or batteries, without burning gas or any other fossil fuel. Our pilot was Leticia Marquez, the only female Argentinian balloon pilot. She floated in the air lifted by a sculpture that carry her through the only power of the air heated by the sun. Written on the sculpture balloon was a message we conceived on with the indigenous community saying, water and life are worth more than lithium. It was really great to work with the communities of Salina Grandes. They were very happy because we were trying to bring visibility to a struggle that not so many people are aware of.
and together we celebrate their culture of care towards the earth. In the balloon, in the sculpture, their flow was called Pacha, after the Andean conceptions of the cosmos, similarly but differently than Pachamama, Mother Earth, which include uh, Pacha in general, it includes everything and every kind of life, human and non. There is a relationship also with the non-human, which I think so, we are also trying to rethink, to make better choices for this entangled web of life and its relationship. You know that I work with spider intimately and have for many years. And recently, research has come out that particular matter and pollution actually sticks to their webs of the spiders. And when the spider eat it, are affected. They got sick or die, or they start to change how their webs is made. And these webs aren't just their homes. They are like extension of their brain. So the pollution change how they can live and think in a way, which is just like what you write about with people in your book. I think that's, that's really important. Have you noticed, I'm sure you have noticed, but um, not too long after we began to recognize uh, the import of the pandemic, reports began emerging about how being confined to our homes and no longer driving and no longer working in offices and closing factories was having a positive eff effect on parts of the environment. Yeah. The air was clearing in cities that have been suffering smog, you know, horrendously damaging smog for decades. And quite frankly, as I read these reports, part of me began by being a little irritated. So I mm. thought to myself, okay, I know we're all looking for a silver lining, but why aren't we focusing on the effect on people? But yeah. then I quickly realized this is really important. It's almost as if, I don't want to wax too poetic here, but I couldn't shake the feeling. It's almost as if nature has given us a bit of a warning mm. Um, mm. that we need to heed. Uh, this is, you know, an, a glimpse of what the world could look like if we had more sanity in the way we, um, you know, conducted ourselves. If we, you know, took, took a care to eliminate some of the more horrible emissions from industry to drive less. If we did all the things that we intellectually know that we should do to reduce pollution, the world would actually look like a different place. And as you pointed out, it's not just us. And the effect on animal life, the effect on the planet could be dramatic. I think it's true that in one sense, this can be taken as a warning that we absolutely need to heed. Yeah, it's crucial to change behavior the ones that have the privilege to do it, who have the privilege to feel at home, to be at home, who have the privilege to have a home. We would always, all the time, say that when we talk about the we, who is this we? You know what I mean? Your writing makes us realize that there is this racial inequality and injustice in the world. It was quite complicated, the way of articulating. The idea of home, that when we talk about social distance, we actually talk about physical distance. There was a lot of vocabulary, which I think so, we need to be rethought and rearticulated to feel comfortable for all the people who also did not have the capacity or responsibility to. Exactly, don't have the luxury of practicing social distancing. There's been a lot of research in the past uh, about how um, infection actually heightens xenophobia. Uh, yeah. People tend to react to strangers in a more hostile manner and to become more violent when they're threatened with infectious disease. Um, it has to do with primitive um, reaction to being exposed to an illness to which you have no defenses. And uh, unfortunately, in this country, the manifestations are um, not only domestic violence, but also violence against Asian Americans, African Americans, and other ethnic groups. So it's another ugly grace note of this experience um, and how we're reacting to it, which yeah. could have policy implications, I think. If we're going to be optimistic and look beyond what's happening today and think about what's the best way to avoid scenario in the future, how to better handle pandemics in the future, because thankfully it's not true of every country, but our country failed miserably when it came to enacting the right policies in time protect us. And I think it's, you know, imperative that we don't do that again. 
This reminds me of the statistic you quote many times in your book, and that has stuck with me the most, because it's just so striking, that the black family making between 15,000 and 16,000 per year are found more affected by pollutants than white families making only $10,000 per year meaning that race and not class is the most damaging factor. That's Access. an important point. That's such an important point because many people think, including some scientists, you know, many people think that when you see environmental racism, they'll, they'll say it's a misnomer. It's mm -hmm. actually a, mat a factor of poverty. And um, they're wrong. I understand why they think that, but they're wrong. Because it's true that poverty does put one at risk for exposure to environmental contaminants, but race is a much, much powerful, much, much more powerful risk factor. And the figures you just quoted are an exact, a great illustration of, of that. Solidly middle-class African-American families have a much greater exposure to environmental poisons than profoundly poor white ones. So it's, it's areas where people of color live that are under constant assault by a lot of these environmental toxins. And that's something that can be changed with policy. It can be changed with intention. Uh, it won't happen by itself, so we'll have to decide we want to change it, but change it we must. And um, I also, in this country too, what we need desperately is an effective environmental protection agency because ours has been hobbled deliberately, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Really sorry mm -hmm. to say that, but when the current administration came to office, they appointed somebody whose stated goal was to destroy the agency. He was someone who had spent his career in industry and mm. the EPA's regulations when it's functioning well, cost industry money. It costs money to mm. um, dispense with harmful emissions. It costs money to have a product denied because of its effect on humans. And they have rebelled against that. But um, the current administration wanted an EPA that would be industry friendly. That's what they have, but it's also an EPA that has allowed much greater environmental assaults. And that's something we definitely have to change. Is there a group of people who are being disproportionately affected by this? We need to know that in order to protect them, in order to craft better solutions. I think it's vitally important for us to learn from what's happened here. Um, I had a friend who used to always say, when you lose, don't lose the lesson. I think mm -hmm. that applies here very well. Um, things look bleak now. I am convinced we will recover, but the next time things might go more easily if we are alert to the failures that we've had now and determined not to um, reproduce them in the future. And that's, we know how to do that. It's not complicated. We just have to have the intention to do that. I like that you say it's not complicated. It's just take intention. Because I think so, much of the time, people use the cues of it being too complicated as a reason not to do anything because they're afraid. But we just have to start by talking and acknowledging and setting our intention, and then we can take action. In the art world, there are so many things that have been discussed, so many border directions which are trying to figure it out how to solve racial inequalities. One thing also that I'm so happy with it, is that through this exhibition at the shed, we got this conversation and that I got to know you, Harriet, and that we have had the opportunity through your collaboration to bring in so many different forms of knowledge to art to art, because art can't have all the answers. And you know what I mean. That diversity also is something we should celebrate because it's something which make us more resilient. And hopefully your voice will be heard through this exhibition because it's so important, it has been so important to me, and there is so much to learn from you. Well, you, you certainly stand at that border between art and science and <laughs> medicine, and I couldn't agree with you more. We need everything in our arsenal. Hi, all. Hi, Michael. Hi, Leslie. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining the conversation today. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me as well. So I think that uh, it's, it's clear that it's, it's so important to have you as part of this conversation because of the respective work that you both do in, in your communities, um, both Leslie through El Puente and Michael uh, through South, South, South Bronx Unite. Um, 
I think that as part of the series that uh, the shed is organizing and, and with the work of Thomas Saraceno and, and, and the publications and the research by Harriet Washington uh, as part of the Up Close series, their conversation about environmental racism and their art piece and art project of we do not all breathe the same air uh, really sort of strikes a note and, and, and clear reminds of, of the work that you've been doing, uh, again, related to air quality uh, in, in, in the communities that you represent, both the South Bronx and North Brooklyn. Um, so with that in mind, I also wanted to reference uh, a New York Times piece that came out last week uh, July 5th, uh, it's called The Fullest Look Yet at the Racial Inequity of Coronavirus. Uh, and I think it was a very important piece precisely because the New York Times filed this lawsuit and got the federal government to release data. And it clearly showed how Latino and African-American residents of the U.S. were three times as likely to become infected, uh, uh, to become infected with um, the coronavirus, obviously. Than more than white neighbors, uh, and it provided uh, some detailed characteristics of that reality. However, the, the piece um, leaves a little bit to the side, or, or, or it's a little bit more secondary, uh, issues that were already in the communities themselves. And this clearly points back to the, to, again, to the work that Tomas and Harriet is doing, where these are communities that already were facing uh, systemic conditions related to environmental racism, related to um, some of the worst air qualities in the country um, related to some of the highest asthma rates uh, in the country as well that obviously make or exacerbate the, the probability of you getting coronavirus or it becoming even worse uh, in terms of um, how it affects the body uh, even more. Um, so I think that, it, that that's sort of like a great segue to understand a little bit and, and have a conversation about both your work uh, and how in, in the specific communities that you work in, um, what kind of uh, either data gathering you're working on, uh, either um, how it's related to any sort of um, contact or communications with the communities that you work with, uh, and how have that has that played out? Um, yeah. Um, so, El Puente, we have a campaign called Our Air, Nuestro Aire in Spanish, and um, it's a citizen science project. So, we involve young people from our after school programs, as well as young people from El Puente Academy High School, which is a public high school that we found through mobile air quality monitoring with sort of like low cost sensors. So, they're readily accessible um, and they're measuring PM 2.5, which is a kind of um, pollutant. And, PM just stands for particulate matter. Um, so it can involve a lot of different kinds of things, but it just is very small particles of pollution. Um, and we also installed a stationary network um, all across the neighborhood of Williamsburg, which is one of the neighbors, uh, neighborhoods that we service in our work along with Bushwick. Um, they're both in North Brooklyn. Um, but this is, even before this project started, El Puente has been really concerned about air quality in our neighborhood. Um, because we have so many sources of pollution. Um, one of them is the BQE, which is a major highway that runs directly through our neighborhood. It was designed by Robert Moses, um, no surprise there. Um, and it transports tens of thousands of vehicles every day, including um, trucks for industry, um, which are even more polluting than just you know normal cars that people would drive. Um, as well as race transfer stations, which have you know, heavy truck traffic going to and from them all day as well. Um, industrial sites all throughout North Brooklyn. Um, also things like a peaker plant, which is just a power plant that is activated when the overall load to the system is too high. And so that is also extra polluting. Um, so we have all these sources of pollution in our community. And of course, as you would expect, we have um, these sort of health consequences that we see in the form of asthma rates um, being abnormally high and asthma hospitalization rates being extremely high. They're about um, two times the rate of New York City overall and of Brooklyn overall. Um, so this is like a serious health issue. Um, and we wanted to study that through citizen science, really involving our youth so that they, you know, have a hands-on experience of studying this issue that is affecting their lives. Yeah, Michael, I, I think that what's, what's I'm, I was more familiar with your work in South Bronx Unite. Leslie, again, amazing what El Puente is doing there, again, for decades now. Uh, it, it's a, a truly incredible organization, but Michael, it, it actually sounds very familiar to some of the work that you have been working on in the South Bronx through the South Bronx Unite. I think I feel that the 
both the issues that these communities face are very familiar. I don't think it's a coincidence. And I think that also the ways that you've been monitoring air quality and the way that you've been engaging with the community sounds very familiar. Do you want to speak a little bit about a little bit about that? Yes, Oscar, I would love to. Our community here in the Mott Haven, uh, the south, the southernmost tip of the South Bronx, uh, we have some of the highest asthma hospitalization rates in the country, um, nine times the national average, three times New York City. Um, and we also have been touched by Robert Moses with the Cross Bronx Expressway and now two other highway systems that encircle our neighborhood, um, the Bruckner, um, the Deegan and the Cross Bronx all go through our community. Um, we have been uh, struggling with high asthma rates for decades because of the top-down type of decision-making that's occurred here where the higher standards don't really apply to these environmental justice communities as recognized by EPA um, for how you build in these, in these communities that have been overburdened um, with um, heavy industrial sidings, um, waste transfer stations and fossil fuel power plants. We have four in our neighborhood, um, all because our land is cheap. So we partnered with Columbia University about four years ago, the Melman School of Public Health, to do air quality monitoring right in folks' living rooms. So we would put an air quality monitor in your window that brings in air, like an air conditioner into your, into your space. And we, we monitored air in traffic routes or traffic or truck routes to see that were intersecting with residential homes. They see how they're affecting and the measurements that were occurring. Uh, so we measured PM 2.5, black carbon, CO, NO, and also noise. Um, this, this catalyst of this study was done because of another decision to do what Robert Moses did, come and build in our community without higher standards of environmental um, remediation or re environmental in, uh, studies being done, uh, especially uh, renewed uh, environmental impact statements. So it was a, it was a project um, that was brought bringing in additional um, industrial or uh, heavy diesel truck into the business to our neighborhood and it, to bring in a thousand extra uh, trucks to our neighborhood when they already knew we had really high asthma rates. Um, this was done in 2012. Um, it was a relocation of Fresh Direct from, from Queens to the South Bronx. We fought that relocation, knowing there's something wrong with it when you bring in a thousand more trucks to Asthma Alley, which our neighbor is recognized as, without doing a thorough environmental impact statement. Actually, it relied on one that's 20 plus years old to say it was okay to bring this to a community of color that's been suffering for decades. Uh, we fought, we sued, and they still built the facility like they've done over and over again. So we did our own study. Since they didn't do an environmental impact statement, we thought we'd do our own. So we put the monitors in folks' homes to measure air, and we also put radar counters on light posts with a uh, relationship we had with the city's Department of, uh, of, the, of the, the Department of Transportation. We mounted these radar counters on light posts and actually counted trucks and vehicles to see would there be an increase in this existence of this fresh direct relocation. So we did it three months or six months before they opened, and then another six months after they opened their facility, and we saw a great deal of increase in traffic and a decrease in our air quality. High rates of PM 2.5, the study's been published. Um, we're gonna use this information. It seems that it should be known when you bring in more trucks, you're gonna get worse air quality, especially diesel trucks. And even if they, their trucks are running on water, the congestion or the impact of a tr additional trucks on our streets will cause you know, a concentration of traffic, which will cause poor air quality. So. You know, we're using um, our, this data to create hopefully research driven solutions. And we're also going to do a citizen science project coming up next with COVID actually hurt that from starting right away with some local high schools where we're going to do a STEM project where actually the students will be creating the, their, their monitor themselves with the, with the assistance of our team showing how to put it together and how they can monitor CO, NO, and PM 2.5 in live time going back to our server that we will be um, man, manning. Um, and also notice. So I think that's, it's important to look at the, all the environmental uh, effects on our community that are cause, are triggers for asthma and asthma, uh, asthma episodes um, that be, because of now COVID, all the pre-existing conditions and the historical um, um, uh, hurt or harm that's been done to our environment and our community we're seeing higher rates of COVID, 
Um, we're seeing higher fatality rates and, and we have high density of public housing. In our neighborhood, we have uh, five public housing community uh, developments, one of the highest densities in the city. And there's no real race before COVID. There's no race here now to actually make sure the folks who have been underserved and overburdened with environmental degradation, environmental harm, um, are not being dealt with appropriately. And that's why we're trying to do all we can to make sure we advocate for our community. And I'm glad to be a part of this conversation because I think it needs to continue to happen. Uh, that, that's incredible, Michael. In, in, in a sense, um, I'm a little bit more familiar with the South Bronx, but I really want to hear from Leslie in, in terms of, um, you mentioned some of the work that you have been doing in the Puente, but I want to understand how that, you know, the, the health outcomes we've been talking about, the El Puente's agenda, very much about environmental justice, et cetera, and how now with COVID times, uh, your communities have been affected in what way, and also understanding how El Puente has had to react to that. So part of the Air, our AIR project was working with graduate students at um, the Pratt Institute and the New School, and they came up with like urban design and policy solutions to improve air quality in our neighborhood. And that was super holistic, included things like, you know, not just addressing traffic, but improving green infrastructure, which we also have, um, it's a huge injustice in our community. We have very little um, green space. and that green space that does exist is all around um, the BQE, um, which is a huge source of pollution. So that's a big problem for us too. But um, those policies were really about holistic community development. So actually through that, we, we wanted to address the fact that we have underfunded hospitals, and this was even before COVID happened. We wanted to address the fact that we had underfunded hospitals that there was little you know, planning for community resilience in our communities, which are climate justice communities. So they will be hit hard by natural disasters as well as pandemics. Um, you know, COVID is a result of, of climate change and you know, um, basically pandemics can become more frequent with climate change because of the way that um, natural habitats for animals shift and they interact with humans in, in new ways. Um, so basically we understood that sort of there was disasters coming to our neighborhood and we needed to be prepared. Um, and so a lot of those policy solutions are actually now becoming very prevalent, like things like addressing underfunded hospitals, addressing community resilience through creating plans and task force and really about, you know, building networks of resilience between organizations like ours, government agencies, um, other stakeholders in the community, and also just the fact that a lot of our community does have chronic health issues and that's because of the environmental conditions that they live in. Um, you know, people, people are hospitalized all the time in our community um, and they go to hospitals that are not known for having high quality care. So that's just injustice on top of injustice. Um, but we really, we've been, you know, adapting and responding in, in how we always do. I think a lot of organizations like El Puente, um, and, and others were formed in response to the fact that the government did not invest in our communities in the first place. So institutions like ours had to exist to take care of the community because the government was not there at all. Um, and we've seen, you know, the government failed to protect people on so many levels um, in this crisis, not just the federal government, but our city government did not respond in a timely manner or in a way that was comprehensive or effective. So we really, you know, our, we see that we need to step up and we need to take care of our community because you know we don't know who else will if we don't. Um, so part of that has involved sort of doing direct response stuff like you know providing. Um, we have two centers in NYCHA housing, so we've set up um, food distribution there for the community. But we also have been doing a lot of um, just outreach and referrals and calling our all of our families that we work with and checking in on them and seeing what they need. Um, and now this summer, we're really taking that to a new level. We want to make sure that all of our centers are equipped to um, actually provide referrals and like walk our community members through these sort of services that they need and like how to get them. Um, because, you know, a lot of things are not accessible in multiple languages. We serve a primary like, Latinx community and a lot of them don't speak English. Um, and we understand now that, you know, we need to make those services accessible in that way and be there to like guide people through how to, you know, file for unemployment and other things like that. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and through those centers, we also want to address wellness in a holistic way and talk about nutrition and, you know, just taking care of yourself and 
in addition to sort of the environmental hazards that we are experiencing. You mentioned at, at kind of like at the beginning how it's about air quality, it's about all these sort of systemic racist policies, it's about all these sort of things that 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 are kind of have become very evident in how they affect people's health. But you also mentioned lack of open space. And I think that, Michael, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about this because I know that South Bronx Unite also has a strong agenda on either the improvement, creation, or access to open space within the South Bronx and how, that's very important pre-COVID times, how now during COVID and post-COVID that's even more important because people need to go somewhere. I really appreciate that question. It is very important to what we've been focusing on. Um, we have upwards of about 90,000 people living in about two and a half square miles. And we only have one park. Uh, the others are playgrounds that are asphalt uh, and or community gardens that are built out in necessity. And the community said, hey, we need to have access to green and permeable surfaces. We're gonna create our own. Um, so we've looked at intently because of how we can create more because we know that the way we get to health is we have to have mental as well so as physical health and green space helps create that. And we have high rates of obesity and diabetes because of the lack of green space. Um, New York for Parks did a study um, a couple years back showing that we have some like the least quantity of green space per capita than anywhere else in the city. See, all the things I've already talked about, the burden is community sh shouldering, but to lay on top of it, there's no like, equitable access to green space, it's a sin, you know, it's like an assault. It's, it's not laughable, but it's criable, right? That these, our, our community and our children um, can't go to a peninsula that we're surrounded by. Don't know that there's water there. If you say, hey, where's the water at in our neighborhood? They're like, what water? Because it's blocked off by industrial facilities. We have one of the largest significant maritime industrial areas in the city. 106 acres stretching from our community all the way to Port to Hunts Point, um, lending its way to no access point for our community members. So we've looked at how we could look at what are some of the underutilized spaces along the publicly owned waterfront that we have no access to, to create green space uh, for recreation opportunities, but also for flood mitigation, which is about the climate change fight we're also dealing with. You know, this COVID was, wasn't the storm we're looking, we're wait, we're planning on. We're planning on the next sea level uh, rise and storm surge to happen to come breach our shores that we're not ready for. And that's why we needed a waterfront plan, which we were fortunate enough to plan ahead to create a waterfront plan to get it prioritized by the State Department of Environmental Conservation that's still waiting to be activated. So there's place and space along our peninsula we identified through our waterfront plan it will be a seven connecting sites that will be contiguous along the peninsula to give our residents access, but also barriers and permeable surfaces from um, that will reduce the, the likelihood of all the contaminants that are along our peninsula that flood our community. So what we got instead was COVID, but we know the storm is still coming. Today we're dealing with the breaching of a superstorm coming our way in, in, in the East Coast. And I think it's not, it's not unlikely that Sandy will happen again to us. Um, it's it really important that we protect the mental and physical health of our residents and having one park is an injustice in the community for 90,000 people. Um, the asphalt doesn't work. I mean, we as human beings feel better when we're on earth and ground, on dirt and close to water. And to make a community who uh, not allow or pr provide equitable access to green space and waterfront access into water uh, is a real environmental injustice and actually we look at it as environmental racism. Because how can you do the same thing over and over again to the same community of color that's economically oppressed and I'm not gonna say poor, which we have the, the, the on the level of economically oppressed congressional districts or either worse, right? Um, um, and throughout the United States. And I'll say, okay, poorest congressional district in the United States. I don't like saying poor, but we can't have all these things built up in one community and don't add anything positive. And that's what's been, I mean, I live here in Mount Haven. I'm talking to you all from right now from Mount Haven. Um, I see our children. I've seen, Beck, I've seen generations of children raise, rise and grow and try to go to school. And that's why we think this connection between health and education and the arts is so important too. We look at that as contiguous to the education that's necessary to be healthy, holistically healthy. 
And with that, we've led to, you know, other avenues. And maybe we have time to talk about it now, or maybe have time to talk about it another time. But it's about, we look at it as creating like health, education, and, and the arts opportunities for our community to make us more holistically a community of health. Um, and I think it's only going to come from the ground up because the top down has never done it. They're not really asking the right questions. And when they do, they don't really implement our answers. So yes, thank you, uh, Oscar, for asking the question about green space. And we put a lot of time into our community gardens that we have. And that's really, when you look at the community gardens we create, and you've been to Brook Park, one of our favorite spaces in our community. When you look at that space, it's true representation of our heritage and our culture, right? There's no permeable surfaces and everything you see there has been put there by the community. It's been planned and developed by people who live here. And it's a special place and it feels special because of that. With the uh, weeping willows and the cherry blossom circle and the uh, raised beds, the chicken coop, the beehive, you know, and even um, a 30 foot teepee that a, a child was born in. We have Native American ceremonies in our plate, in our park. So it's important because that's our culture in this community, a melting pot of various um, um, ethnicities feeling welcome in this space. So. Thank you for that question about green space. It's very important. Yeah, I know definitely Brook Park is truly a, a special place, but it is very much a product of the effort by the communities and by the, some of the leaders that are almost there every day, keeping that space running. It's, it's, it's truly an incredible uh, place to go to. Um, I think that there's no coincidence here that in hearing you out, uh, the agenda, right for for each of your group south bronx united and when they are, are are so similar again because they are reacting to even though they're different geographies within new york city they're reacting basically to the same kind of conditions that are mostly a product of environmental racism as we as said and leslie and uh, uh, michael mentioned how in south bronx united there is this agenda of education and working with children working with adults uh through the arts through other means in sort of making sure that not only are they participants, active participants in, for example, the, the air quality monitoring and, and other work that you guys do related to uh, getting some of the very important data that is needed that is not being provided by other entities. And, and I want to sort of like quote here something that uh, is in, in, in this website that it says, it, using the arts for social, social justice activism is the El Puente model. Can you speak a little bit about that and maybe show some of the examples uh, that your team has been working with? Uh, yeah, um, that's exactly what I was gonna say <laughs> when you asked me that question about the Oponte model. Um, so Oponte has always been an arts organization. We've always been a youth development organization and the arts has always been a means of us connecting to our community. Um, and when we refer to the Oponte model, we really, see the arts as like a means of personal transformation because when someone is making when a young person is making a piece of art about a social justice issue they're really learning about it and internalizing it and then they're using their own creative voice and talents to say something about that issue so they're like not only learning about it but they're expressing themselves and really owning that and you know, making a personal statement about something, which I think is one of those powerful ways you can connect with an issue. Um, and not only that, but the community that receives that art, you know, their families and just community members around them in general, um, they're also learning about that issue. And for us, that's also really important. The arts is important um, because, you know, the arts oftentimes is a very exclusive industry and yet everyone has creative talents. Everyone has something to say about something. Um, and we are a heavily gentrifying community, you know, Williamsburg gentrified basically in the, the 90s and the early 2000s. So I think there's a, a lot of a sense and, and we also serve Bushwick, which is gentrifying now. Um, there's a sense among the original community members of loss and that they're being pushed out and a lot of them have been pushed out. Um, and they have such, you know, a rich culture and heritage and the arts is you know part of culture and heritage and so when we're using the arts we're not just you know doing what i said about you know social justice activism we're also you know preserving culture in a way and making art and saying something about an issue in a way that is culturally responsive and relevant to the people that we're trying to talk to um and so 
yeah, like I said, it's a means of preservation as well as, you know, activism and saying something about an issue. Um, and for this project, Our Air, we really wanted all of our sort of outreach and, and engagement and advocacy to be very arts focused. So we've done a number of arts projects um, about this specific project. Um, one of them was this play called Breathe. It was done by Cadre, which is our work of local artists. Um, it's our group of local artists. And it's kind of the story of these kids and they're members of El Puente and they're, you know, talking to the trees in the community and finding out they're sick and really like learning about this issue. Um, and it's great. And it has a participatory component actually where they ask the audience members, you know, what can we do about air quality? So not only is it informing the audience, it's really trying to like bring them in and say, you know, help us and be part of this um, campaign and, and help us figure out how to, how to do something about this. Um, and we also had our kids do a puppet show, which was really great. And they made the puppets themselves um, about the project. We've also had Sylvia Hernandez. She's amazing. She, she did a quilt for us about the project. Um, and she's, she's just an incredible artist in general. She works with us a lot. But um, so it's, it's really spanned a lot of things. Even the logo for our, our, our campaign was de designed by our young people um, and, and developed and, and drawn by them. Yeah. And, and Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to maybe hear out a little bit of some of the work that you've been doing with, through, through the arts, through this sort of edu educational model that Leslie was also referencing. But another thing that maybe be worth it for, for the audience to hear is um, some of the work that you've, the South Bronx Unite has been doing with, with, with colleges and universities. And, and that also as a model of, you know, engaging and, 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 and all the education and, and the, coordination with the communities that that kind of entails. Uh, and I know that you, South Orange Unite has been kind of working with uh, City College amongst other entities, for example, with the with Lincoln, uh, the, the former, I'm blanking on the name here, but the former Lincoln uh, Health Center um, and, and some of the work that you've been doing in, in terms of claiming that space that of course has this incredible history with the Young Lords uh, in the 80s overtaking this space, uh, completely abandoned and underutilized. Again, systemic racism at play, environmental racism at play, lack of health uh, options, and suddenly this empty building, empty shell, um, uh, and the young lord sort of providing and, and you know doing the work by themselves, given that they had been so a product of this investment and they had been sort of victims of, of this lack of, 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 of investment by the city. Uh, so I know that your your team at South Bronx Unite have been working with, with, with some students at City College and we're sort of, from an architectural lens, maybe in a design lens, also kind of engaging in a form of, you know, coordination and education through the arts of maybe rethinking the space as a space for the community. Yeah. Yeah, again, thank you for that, Oscar. Um, yeah, this, you know, we, we, we look at the collaboration we do with multiple institutions from Pratt to you know, that Bernard and Ann School of Architecture at, at City College to UPenn um, and others as a, as a way of like planting seeds for change. Um, and those collaborations have come up with great ideas um, that are fed from the community through visioning sessions. Um, the, the, the building you're speaking of with such history or the Young Lords, the old People's Detox Center, um, out of necessity, they came together because the old Lincoln House built here in the neighborhood was a butcher shop, they called it. Um, no, no bilingual you know, uh, ability to speak to people from the community, no services that were really... So the first people's doctrine around doctrine or policy around healthcare came out of that 24-hour takeover of Lincoln Hospital, which is now a national requirement. Um, for how we deal with people in communities and a, a status or a certain criteria that has to be met. But they also created a, a system of acupuncture and Reiki as a, as a means of recovery from heroin and cocaine addiction. And that was out of the need of the community. We needed that substance, we needed some sort of uh, ability to do that and not have to rely on another drug like, um, you know, methadone. And so we looked at their, them as a model of how they created a holistic approach to recovery and we're trying to create a holistic approach to community health. With this building, which is city owned now, 25,000 square feet, we're trying, we've been trying to acquire from the city to create a health education and arts center. We call it HEARTS because the health, we know it's the high rates of asthma, obesity, and diabetes. 
the education, of course, you know, the worst performing school district in the city, in our community, with this, which is maybe 150 feet away is a, is a public school. Um, and then, of course, the arts. Our, our, our communities contributed to two music genres, hip hop and salsa, and had a lot to do with graffiti art. But there's no place our community, our members and our students and our neighborhood, our children go to and really, and really express their natural desire to, to, to express their culture and the arts that's so important to their education and to what we are. And so this building is only one of those sites that we're looking at creating, they're really activating for the purpose and the use and the ownership of the community through a model of the community land trust. And that's another that subject we can talk about, but has been one of our main focuses now has led us from environmental justice to looking at how do we use land and how do we make sure that land in our communities can create the green space can create the community centers that we need and create potentially the, the deeply affordable housing that we need to really look at the providing some of the, the, the basic necessities of life that we feel is so definitely needed here in this community. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Michael, Leslie, um, thank you so much for this. I think that if anything, it, it, one of the most important things that we're probably taking out of this is, is sort of seeing how uh, both of your work and, and the work that your spaces do are so familiar, are so much in line. Uh, you can call them sister neighborhoods, I think. Um, again, a product, both a product of victims or victims of environmental racism, but clearly also agents of their environments and, and, and sort of a group that is clearly working for positive and much needed change. So I really appreciate your time and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you, Leslie. It's nice to meet you too. <laughs>